One of the essayists, Professor William A. Ganson of Boston College, emphasizes much like Rousseau, the significance of the collective identity. He writes in part that, quote, participation in social movements frequently involves an enlargement of personal identity for participants and offers fulfillment and realization of the self. Participation in the civil rights movement, women's movement, and New Left, for example, was frequently a transformative experience central to the self-definition of many participants in their later lives. The construction of a collective identity is the most central task of new social movements, end quote. Group identity is necessary and critical to the success of the movement. Quote, when people bind their fate to the fate of the group, argues Gamson, they feel personally threatened when the group is threatened. Solidarity and collective identity operate to blur the distinction between individual and group interests, undermining the premise on which such alteration models operate, end quote. Gamson insists that for a movement to effectively mobilize, it must be viewed and in fact must become the identity through which the individual views himself. Quote, collective identity is a concept at the cultural level, but to operate in mobilization, individuals must make it part of their personal identity. Solidarity centers in the ways in which individuals commit themselves and the resources they control to some kind of collective actor, an organization, or advocacy network. Adopting a collective action frame involves incorporating a product of the cultural systems, a particular shared understanding of the world, into the political consciousness of individuals. Individual and social cultural levels are linked through mobilizing acts in face-to-face -face encounters." End quote. Assistant Professor Deborah Friedman and Professor Doug McAdam, then of the University of Arizona, bluntly declare, quote, the collective identity of social movement organization is a shorthand designation announcing a status, a set of attitudes, commitment, and rules for behavior that those who assume the identity can be expected to subscribe to, end quote. They continue, quote, it is also an individual announcement of affiliation, of connection with others, to partake of a collective identity is to reconstitute the individual self around a new and valued identity, end quote. In essence, therefore, the individual is being reinvented and remade. He is being conditioned and programmed into a devoted social activist or revolutionary tied inextricably to the cause through the movement. As regards a social movement, write Friedman and McAdam, quote, collective identity refers to the, that identity or status that attaches to the individual by virtue of his or her participation in movement activities. One of the most powerful motivators of individual action is the desire to confirm through behavior a cherished identity. In the case of a movement, the opportunity to do so can be seen as a selective incentive more available to those who are integrated into activist networks than those who are not. Integration into these networks makes it more likely that the individual will value the identity of the activist and choose to act in accordance with it, end quote. In addition to collective identity, the movement's collective beliefs must be drilled into the individual. Professor Burke Candler, Manns of the Free University in the Netherlands, argues, quote, Collective beliefs and the way they are formed and transformed are the core of the social construction of protest. Interpersonal networks submerged in multi-organizational fields are the conduits of this process of meaning construction. Collective beliefs are constructed and reconstructed over and over in public discourse during the mobilization of consensus and in the process of con conscious raising during episodes of the collective action. Because collective beliefs are formed and transformed in interpersonal interactions, attempts to change the mind of a single individual would not be very effective in changing the collective beliefs unless that individual is influential in his or her interpersonal circle. Incoming information is processed and anchored in existing collective beliefs through interpersonal interaction. Only when actors are able to direct this interaction so that their message be uh, becomes anchored in existing beliefs can they transform collective beliefs. Thus, every actor will be able to mobilize consensus more easily in some groups or categories than others." End quote. And then there is class consciousness, including class and group identity, as yet another means to absorb the individual into the collective, that is, the mass movement and revolution. 
Professor Aldon D. Morris of Northwestern University contends, quote, empirical studies using diverse methodologies and conceptual frameworks have demonstrated that class consciousness has developed in a variety of societies and historical periods, and that it has affected major revolutions and social movements. Indeed, class consciousness has been one of the key determinants of social and historical change, end quote. Morris's observation reflect, in a significant way, the teachings of Marx, in that he sees society and culture broken down into classes that are in constant state of competition and conflict. Class consciousness, he writes, is important precisely because it influences the very nature of class conflict and helps determine the kinds of social structures, unions, political parties, workers' associations that will be erected and that affect the outcome of class conflict. Consequently, groups are dominated and oppressed by looking at societies and the culture's structural and historical prejudices and inequities, and the effect on their political influence. Morris declares that, quote, groups' interests become paramount because systems of domination have no meaning outside the accumulation and defense of such interests. The task of precisely identifying the groups who benefit from such systems is complex because several groups usually benefit, although unequally. An important task, therefore, is to establish the relative positions of privilege enjoyed by the groups hierarchically positioned within systems of domination, and to show how such relative positions affect their political consciousness. In this approach, scholarly attention is directed squarely toward the long-standing cleavages within society and the structural preconditions, threats of violence, political membership, economic resources such as the control of jobs, and so on. Inherent to systems of domination that enable certain people to rule. By the same token, attention is focused on the structural uh, preconditions and networks of communications, formal and informal social organization, availability of uh, leadership, financial resources, and so on, central to effective and sustained protest by oppressed groups." End quote. Given the injustices, prejudices, and inequality imposed by society's dominant groups against oppressed groups, the oppressed groups must awaken to their inferior status, become politically aware, and then rise up in protest and even revolution against the existing society. Morris argues, quote, my approach directs attention to culture political consciousness. Such consciousness is also analyzed within the context of major social cleavages and systems of domination. Both dominant and oppressed groups have long-standing traditions of political consciousness. Hegemonic consciousness is always present but often unrecognized because of its ability to successfully masquerade as the general outlook while simultaneously protecting the interests of dominant groups. But effective social protest informed by a mature oppositional consciousness enables challenging groups to strip away the garments of universality from hegemonic consciousness, revealing its essential characteristics. This is precisely what the modern civil rights movement accomplished in the South forcing the nation to decide publicly on the world stage whether it would continue to be guided by blatant white supremacy ideology. The oppressed must be encouraged to rise up and join in protest and even revolution. Oppositional consciousness, explains Morris, often lies dormant within the institutions, lifestyles, and culture of oppressed groups. Members of such groups are usually not without basic collective identities, injustice fa frames, and the like, that are conductive of individual and collective social protest. Morris contends that the seeds of oppositional protest and revolution already exist in oppressed communities, which makes possible the birth of new and more effective forms of collective activism. Quote, cultural phenomena are not reducible simply to organization and structural dynamics. Indeed, varied forms of oppositional consciousness are important precisely because they are able to survive under the most adverse structural conditions. In many ways, oppressed communities nurture oppositional ideas during intense periods of repression, thereby creating the social and cultural space for the emergence of more favorable structural conditions, conductive to collective action." End quote. Moreover, much can be learned from the experiences of successful combat-ready oppositional protest, that is, veterans of protest movements that help spread and sustain activism. Morris writes, quote, 
Combat-ready oppositional consciousness can have an independent effect on structural determinants of collective action. Once a successful instance of protest has occurred, it affects collection action in two ways. It provides those activists who participate directly with the understanding of how it happened and why it worked. And it attracts other non-participants who wish to internalize these lessons so as to transplant the model to other locales, thereby increasing the volume of collective action. Thus, both sets of actors become cultural workers for the movement by further hammering out the set of viewpoints that previously lay dormant within the historic oppositional consciousness, making them relevant for the contemporary scene. In the manner these viewpoints become the defining ideas about how to in initiate and sustain social protests, end quote. Ultimately, these arguments for collective identity, collective beliefs, and class consciousness in support of mass movements, writingly or otherwise, have a Marxist formulation, and from the basis not only for peaceful protests, but violence, riots, and revolution of the sort we have seen in our cities and towns with the likes of Antifa, BLM, and other violent radical groups. In fact, they attempt to provide the veneer of an expertise or scholarly ap approach to the societal disruption, the undermining of civil institutions, and flat out rebellion. Professors Francis Fox Pippin and the late Richard A. Clauhart wrote less about social movement theory and more extensively and openly in support of militant uprisings, and they were more forthright and detailed than many others in the prescriptions for using activism to develop disruption, create crises, collapse institutions, and excite riots as legitimate and necessary to transform society. Therefore, given their extensive writings and influence on radical and even violent revolutionary strategies, they require more substantial expo uh, exposition here. In 1966, the professors wrote what is considered by radical activists a seminal essay in the far-left nation, entitled The Weight of the Poor, A Strategy to End Poverty. Focused on race and poverty, they bluntly stated their intention. It is our purpose to advance a strategy which affords the basis for a convergence of civil rights organizations, militant anti-poverty groups, and the poor. If this strategy were implemented, a political crisis would result at that could lead to the legislation for a guaranteed annual income and thus end to poverty. The pair laid a predicate by arguing that welfare is a right. The welfare payments recipients receive are less than what they are entitled to and efforts to reduce the welfare rolls are an assault on the well-being of the poor and minorities. They contend that more people should enter the system, indeed flood it, and those in the system should demand more benefits to which they are entitled. This would create a major societal crisis. Piven and Cloud wrote that, quote, a vast discrepancy exists between the benefits of which people are entitled under public welfare pro programs and the sums which they actually receive. This gulf is not recognized in a society that is wholly and self-righteous oriented toward getting people off the welfare rolls. This discrepancy is not an accident stemming from bureaucratic inefficiency. Rather, it is an integral feature of the welfare system, which, if challenged, would pre uh, precipitate a profound financial and political crisis. The force for that challenge and the strategy we propose is a massive drive to recruit the poor onto the welfare rolls, end quote.